everybody, and welcome to Queen Storytellers. I am your host, David Lawson. This is episode 7 of 10 in this series that is being presented by the wonderful folks at the Queen's Theatre. Every single week on this show, we have five performers from a various variety of backgrounds that could exist in the writing and the performing world. Theatre, comedy, music, all the little nitty-gritty of everything that exists within those. You know, just look on Google, all the subgenres, anything that could be a writer or performer. They all get brought together here on Queen Storytellers. We have five writers and performers every week on this show performing stories that actually happen to them from their own lives. I am your host, David Lawson. and I'm always so happy to be presenting these shows with all these great performers. So let's get right down to it. Let's get to the performers themselves. First this week, we're going to be hearing from David Hu. David Hu has performed on the popular storytelling podcast, Risk. He's going to be performing a story about getting a particularly grim medical diagnosis. Next up is then Lisa Huberman, who recently won a Queen's Council of the Arts grant for her work. She's going to be performing a story about befriending an elderly woman while being at a disastrous bar mitzvah. And I've been to a few disastrous bar mitzvahs, maybe including my own, so I really like that one. After Lisa, it's going to be Molly Cameron, who you may have heard on the Moth Radio Hour. She's going to be performing a story about getting hit by a car on the streets of New York City. After Molly is Kim Gaynor, whose one-woman show, The Reveal, was presented by the wonderful folks at the All for One Theater here in New York City. Kim is going to be performing a story about riding the New York subway late at night and witnessing a particular tragedy. Our final performer is Gabe Molica, who performed his one-man show, The Whole Thing, at the 2019 Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Gabe Molica is going to be performing a story of a particular blend of celebrity encounter. Hint, it involves Bill Murray. So folks, if you like what you see today, then please go to queenstheater.org where you can see the other episodes of Queen Storytellers as well as all the other great programming that Queen Storytellers, well, excuse me, Queen Storytellers, that Queen's Theater is presenting right now, Queen Storytellers being one of those shows, or you can go to facebook.com and like Queen's Theater. That is theater with an R E. You can like Queen's Theater on Facebook and you can find out about all the other great content coming to you from Queen's Theater, not just Queen's Storytellers. But let's get right to it, folks. I'm your host, David Lawson. As always, so happy and excited to present these five writers and performers performing these five stories for you good folks watching at home. Please enjoy Queen's Storytellers. After I got laid off of my job of over 12 years back in March of 2017, it happened to be the saddest and happiest day of my life. I worked on a trading floor and fixed computers. Every day I dealt with traders. It was extremely stressful and demanding. And it took a huge emotional and physical toll on my body. Every day I was tired, I had this chronic cough, and I was just riddled with anxiety. On the bright side, they gave me a severance to start a new chapter of my life. During my time off, I got a chance to spend it with family, friends, traveled, and got a chance to tell stories. And I did that for over a month. And then I decided I'm going to find a new job. And during this period, a transition, I get a letter in the mail from my former employer letting me know that my health insurance is about to expire in a couple of weeks. I had this chronic cough for years and I've been tired too long. And I always did not bother to go see the doctor. So, because when you work on the training floor, your family, friends, and health come last. And I decided to schedule an annual physical the following day. During that exam, the doctor checks my pulse. He checks my heartbeat. It's amazing. He then puts his hands around my neck. They're cold and they're firm, and he applies pressure. And I feel this 
tender pain on the right side to surge through my body. And I look at the reflection in the mirror. It's red, it's swollen, and it's the size of a baby's fist. And the doctor asked me, how long have I had that bump on the right side of my neck? I'm like, I don't know. What is it? And he's like, I don't know. Pull down your pants. That's not the answer I'm looking for, but I told him, just to let you know, I got two bumps down there. What I thought to be a quick and seamless angle physical ended up being an all day ordeal. He sent me upstairs because he wanted to get an ultrasound of my entire neck. I remember laying down on this flat examination table. It was hard, it was cold, as the nurse is prodding my neck with this barcode scanner that you see at a supermarket. It was extremely uncomfortable. And after the exam, I'm sitting in the waiting room, and on the corner of my eye, I see the doctor and nurse looking over my results, and it doesn't look good. And I just feel like this surge of adrenaline running through my body. It feels like pins and needles. And the doctor walks out and they feel this lump in my throat and I know it's going to be bad. And he says, you know what? I think it's a cyst, but I'm not sure. That sounds very reassuring. And he refers me to a specialist who could possibly provide me antibiotics. However, the specialist is booked till the end of the summer. And I told him, hey, listen, my health insurance is about to expire in a couple of weeks. What should I do? And he was all nonchalant about it. He said, oh, I wouldn't sweat it. I don't think it's anything bad. I guess. I guess I can't spend this whole summer and wonder if it's bad or not. So that evening, I go online and I find a doctor willing to see me. He's an older gentleman in his 70s named Dr. Rayfield. And I sat down with him and I explained to him my situation. And he's like, okay, are you always tired? I'm like, yes. Are you always coughing? I said, yes. Are you always sweaty? Can't you tell? I'm a nervous wreck. I'm dying to know what's wrong with me. And he's like, I don't know. I want you to go get a biopsy. Thank God he didn't tell me to pull down my pants. I get a biopsy the following afternoon. And a week later, I remember I was leaving a job interview. And I would get a call from Dr. Rayfield, urgent please stop by my office to go over the results. I'm like, great, he finally got some antibiotics for me. I go into his office and he sits me down and he says, Dave, I can't believe the doctor told you it was a cyst. It's actually a malignant tumor, Dave. When he said tumor, I felt my entire body go numb and it had this like endless pit in my stomach. All my emotions and insides almost like drained into that pit avoid and he says you need to get it to remove and he refers me to a surgeon however the surgeon is booked till the end of the summer and i told him hey listen my health insurance is about to expire in a few days would it be possible i can wait till i find a full-time job to get this resolved and he says no you need to get removed asap because it's spreading across your neck and one of the takeaways I got from working on the trading floor for over the past 12 years was not the bro antics that went down, please refer to the Wolf of Wall Street, is to remain focused, especially during times of uncertainty. And what I did was I went across town and I went directly to that surgeon's office. And I spoke to his assistant and I pleaded my ass off. I said, hey, listen, I just got laid off this past March. My health insurance is about to expire in a few days. Now I have this malignant tumor that's spreading across my neck. Would it be possible if I can see the doctor before my health insurance expires? And she looks at me and she walks away. And 10 minutes later, she comes back. She says, okay, the doctor will be willing to see you tomorrow. However, you need to get your insurance straightened out before the surgery. And I felt this like weight just lifted off my shoulders. I'm like, thank you. And when I left the office, I get a phone call from my former employer letting me know that my health insurance is not going to expire in a few days, but at the end of the year. All they wanted me to do was confirm if I want to extend it. And I'm like, yes! And I just broke down in the middle of the street and cried. It was just 
all these emotions were just running through my body. It was just like a roller coaster of emotions. And on July 11th of 2017, I underwent surgery to remove a three inch tumor from the right side of my neck that was actually cancer. And I spent the next two months over my folks' house in the Bronx. Living back home with, your, with my folks felt like I was in prison because they did not have any cable TV. But during that time in solitude, it, I kind of like took a step back and thought about my life and how my mom and dad was always by my side during this really low period of my life. And I eventually found a new job. And at the end of that year, I underwent radiation treatment. And today I'm cancer free. And just as a token of appreciation to my folks, I got them cable TV. And what I learned from the experience is that, you know, getting laid off on my job was actually a blessing disguised. It saved my life. Because if I was still employed today, I would still be living with cancer. Thank you. So I feel like I spent a lot of my childhood auditioning, partly because I come from a family of musical theater people. My dad never missed an opportunity to take the stage, literally or figuratively. In our town, my dad was sort of like George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. He was a local magistrate. He was on the theater board, the school board, the temple board, you name a board, he was on it. And so when we'd be out, there was always this sort of pressure to be on because he might be recognized. Like we would be in the grocery store and some woman would come up to him and say, are you attorney Mark Huberman? And then my dad would just talk to her for 20 minutes in the organic produce section of Giant Eagle. And after the woman would leave, I would say to my dad, hey dad, did you know who that was? And dad would say, I had no fucking clue. Dad's maxim was, fake it till you make it. And he just has this amazing ability to just make people feel at ease and not let anything else get to him. And the man was raised a raw food vegan in Ohio in the 50s. And so he just has nerves of Teflon. I did not inherit that. And it was hard growing up as an awkward, nerdy, vegetarian Jewish theater kid in Ohio in the 90s who was made fun of for everything from the avocado rice cakes I would bring to school to my taste in obscure Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals. And when I would come home and be upset that I couldn't relate to kids my own age, dad would say, we're interested in people who are interested in us. Mom was equally unhelpful. She was a self-help addict. And so for her, every interpersonal conflict was an opportunity for personal growth. She would say, now, how can, insert the name of bully here, be your teacher? And so I felt like I walked around life with stage fright, like butterflies in my stomach, afraid that at any moment I would be pushed on stage and expected to perform. And if I didn't say the right thing, if I missed the line, skipped a step, I would miss a callback for my professional and emotional and spiritual future. And I came to feel like I was a leaky faucet, just ready to overflow with emotions at any time. That inherently I was just too much. And then I read Anne of Green Gables, which was about this plucky, redheaded girl in a small town who was also a lot, but she used her too muchness as a superpower to connect with people and inspire people. And the thing that I really took away from this was 
how she protected herself from the small-minded assholes in her town was finding kindred spirits, these older women who were sort of her surrogate mother figures who appreciated her weirdness and kind of protected her from the social politics of Avonlea. And then I thought, that's what I need. I need to find a kindred spirit of my own. And so I worked to try to manifest this. And then I ended up finding my kindred spirit in the most unlikely of places at the bar mitzvah of my Hebrew school nemesis. Now, Alex Zoldan was like a cross between Eric Cartman from South Park and Harry Potter's awful spoiled cousin Doug, Dudley Dursley. And for years in Hebrew school, he would every day throw paper balls down my shirt and say things like, hey, Lisa, you're pretty, pretty ugly. And no one would do anything because he was the son of a local fireworks magnate. And because his dad was rich and gave a lot of money to the local Jewish Federation, no, no, no one was going to kick him out of Hebrew school. And because it was my bat mitzvah year, and when it's your year, you have to go to the parties of every single person in your class, I was forced to go to Alex Zoldan's obnoxious Menches in Black themed bar mitzvah party that this was 1998 at Squaw Creek Country Club, which was the Jewish country club in town. And so after enduring a couple nauseating rounds of electric slide or whatever terrible party games and dances were trendy then, I took refuge in the women's restroom on this plush faux luxe couch. But for once, I wasn't alone. Sitting next to me was this tiny, fabulous old woman who looked like she had just jumped right out of the screen from an episode of a nanny. She had this jet black hairspray designing women hair, this black, uh, this leopard print, tiny tight pencil skirt, and these pearls and black eyeliner and this glamorous black turtleneck that encased these boobs that were so sharp and pointy they could poke someone's eye out. And she looked over to me and said, you okay, doll? And I kind of whimpered, yeah, it's just Alex Bolden. He's such a, he's such a, he's a putt, just like his father. And I was flabbergasted. I'd never heard a grown-up talk that way, or at least not outside of an episode of Sex in the City. And this woman extended this bony manicured hand and said, I'm Margie. Uh, and I must have sat with Margie for an hour on that couch, just gossiping and gabbing and feeling just so sophisticated. But more importantly, my butterflies were gone. And for the first time all evening, I felt like I could exhale and breathe. And so then when I went back out there, I didn't feel like I was gasping anymore. My lungs felt stronger. And if, it was, if this was like a lap races in a pool, I had the strength to finish. And so it turned out Margie owned an alteration shop down the street from my grandparents' health food store. And so every day after school, when my grandparents would pick me up, I would walk down the plaza to the black awning with the yellow fringe and the big sign above that said in fancy cursive script, Maji's Golden Needle. And inside was this cavern of wonders like Ariel's Grotto in The Little Mermaid, filled with designer beaded vintage gowns and old purses and these giant art prints with gouty gold frames. And she would just sit and sew and very patiently listen to me just spill all my feelings about my parents' custody battle and the 
politics at the school lunch table or the recent audition that I didn't get. And you know, these moments were just like an oasis to help me get me through this really overwhelming period of my life. And eventually, I stopped going to Margie's probably because I started doing theater. And so after school, I was going downtown to rehearsal rather than my grandparents' health food store. But this experience in kindred spirit seeking ended up becoming a template for how I found support and survival throughout high school, throughout college, throughout grad school. And eventually, I left the Midwest and realized that there were coalitions and communities of people my own age who didn't make me feel like I had to hold my breath all the time to feel normal. People for whom my emotionality could actually be not a weakness, but a strength. And so even still, nowadays, I still fall into my dad's fake it till you make it mentality I've come to learn that the best performances, whether on stage or off, are not ones where I'm trying to fake it till I make it, but ones where I'm present in my messy, leaky, authentic self, where I allow myself to breathe. Thank you. Okay, in the fall of 2006, I decided to live my dream of moving to New York City, moving from my small New Hampshire town with my dream of making it in theater. And I didn't know what making it meant, but I figured I would just know when I found out and when I got there. Uh, but ever since I was a little kid, I just wanted to be an actor in New York City. So I figured the first step is getting to New York City. And at 23, I didn't have a job there. I didn't have a place to live, but I did have friends. So I very quickly found myself crashing on the futon of my friend's living room slash kitchen, and I was helping them produce a set of short plays. And then soon after that, I found a job as a receptionist slash assistant at a theater company slash conservatory. There were a lot of slashes in my life at this time. And I knew that being a receptionist slash assistant uh, was not being an actor. And for my friend's shows, I was mostly just running props, but these all just felt like a step in the right direction. I was finally following this path towards my dream. And about a month into this, in late October, my friend's show opened and there was an after party after opening night. And I was in this theater lobby, like drinking cheap wine and eating cake and talking about Brecht with strangers. And I was like, this is it. I'm, this is the beginning of making it. I am on the right path. And the next day at my job, which was just my sixth day at this job, my boss asked me if I would run an errand to pick up some tickets for a board member in Greenwich Village. So I just have to walk from Chelsea to Greenwich Village and back. And I was pretty hungover from all the cheap wine and the cake. So I was like, absolutely, I would love to go for a walk. And I really took my time walking to Greenwich Village and walking back to Chelsea. And as I came up East 8th Street, approaching Fifth Avenue, I was feeling great. I was feeling refreshed and confident. I had that early autumn air on my face, feeling like a dog in the back of a Jeep, just like, oh, I'm so happy to be here. And then I heard a siren and I looked up and a Chevy Suburban was flying through the air, like something out of an action movie. And then that Chevy Suburban hit me. And in moments like this, you hear about people's life flashing before their eyes, and that didn't happen to me at all. I didn't see God or Muhammad or Buddha or a white light either, which is kind of disappointing because why have a near-death experience if you're not going to get a sense of the divine? But I didn't remember flying into the air either. I didn't remember crashing into the building next to me. I didn't remember hitting the sidewalk. And I think my brain chose to erase those things because they were not worth remembering. But the next thing I do remember is being lifted into an ambulance and just surrounded by people asking questions and all sorts of noises, just saying like, what's your name? Do you know what happened? You've been in an accident. And I was pumped full of so much adrenaline that I didn't feel any pain at all. I sensed that I couldn't move my right arm 
So I thought, okay, my right arm is broken, but why are they putting me in a neck brace? Why are they cutting off all my clothes? I was like, excuse me, these jeans are from Topshop in London and you are ruining them. Also, I have these very important tickets to get back to my very important adult job. So please let me leave, I am fine. And I would later learn that a Chevy Suburban was flying through the air because it had been hit by a fire truck coming through the intersection at the same time. And I would learn that my right arm was indeed broken. And so was my shoulder and my collarbone and part of my jaw and a bone in each leg and one side of my pelvis. And on top of that, I also had a third degree chemical burn on one leg and my teeth were all mangled and my face was covered in blood. So I like to think about the ambulance journey now from the point of view of those lovely heroic EMTs, seeing this 23 year old young lady, just half naked, covered in blood, mangled teeth, yelling about jeans and theater tickets. And I was not fine. And it took a while for that to sink in. They brought me to St. Vincent's in the West Village and after a while in the ER, they gave me a CT scan. And I don't know if you've ever been lucky enough to have a CT scan, but it's basically like a big hard surface that's a giant x-ray and they x-ray your whole body. And when they put me on this hard surface, I suddenly felt every broken bone. And I screamed, I cried, I think I swore a lot and I cried because it was so much pain, but also because I was so mad. It was, it was unfair. Like this was not how my new super cool New York life was supposed to be. I was supposed to be drinking in bars and hanging out with friends and performing on stages, not covered in blood in a hospital gown in St. Vincent's ICU. But like it or not, this was how my New York story was starting. And it took me even longer to understand the full extent of the injuries and the full extent of recovery. For about the whole time I was in St. Vincent's, I just kept thinking, okay, just give me a couple more days and I'll be back to work. I'll be back to the theater. I'll be back on that futon in my friend's apartment. But the doctors started talking about recovery in terms of months, not days. And after 10 days in St. Vincent's, I had to leave and go back to New Hampshire, where I bounced between a couple more hospitals and then eventually had to move back in with my parents until I fully recovered and fully went through physical therapy. And it took me about five months total to graduate from bed to wheelchair to crutches to walking upright normally and to move back to New York City. And I think of that time back in that October as like a false start. Like it's, it's kind of like when you start a new game of Mario Brothers and you're walking confidently down that path and then you just immediately collide with a turtle and you die and you're like, really, I just started. But you don't give up, you go back and you start a new game. And I feel like the Chevy Suburban was my very massive turtle. And I started over. I wasn't going to let that one terrible experience hold me back from trying to live out this dream. So I've been back in New York City for 13 years now. And I have had some more terrible experiences that feel like the city is testing me again and saying, are you sure? Are you sure you wanna be here? <laughs> but I am sure because all of the cool people I've met and the wonderful experiences I've had outweigh the bad. And I still don't know if I've made it or when I will know. And my path has changed a little, but I do get to drink in bars and I get to perform on stages. So I'm sorry, New York, but I'm staying. Thank you. The story starts in a bar and ends up in a subway car. I don't think it's giving away too much to start like that. Uh, it's just that I find it interesting that now in this moment, they almost seem like quaint relics of yesteryear. 
a place where New Yorkers would gather across all races and classes to a certain extent. And they're really quite a cultural touchstone for New York City. So one evening I was to meet my friend Sai in a bar in Chelsea. He stood me up. So I sat there with my feelings and had one drink and another and another and another. I left the bar, got on the subway, and somehow found myself asleep and then waking up in Queens. I got off the train, tried to reorient myself. It was my old neighborhood, after all, Jackson Heights. I go to get some delicious Colombian food at about three o'clock in the morning get back on the train, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to make it home, make that transfer to the blue line going uptown that goes alongside the Upper West Side and Central Park going uptown. It's about 3.30, 3.45, and I see a guy sitting across from me. He's got red hair, he's dressed you know, nicely, maybe on the trendy side. He's awake, which sets him apart from most people on the train at this hour. He doesn't look happy or sad. He doesn't look drunk or high. He's just there, riding, trying to get home, probably just like me. Suddenly, I notice that something changes. His breathing becomes labored. His chest is heaving up and down. His face turns red and then blue. I get out of my seat. I go to him and I say, sir, are you okay? Uh, is there any medication I can get out of your bag? Mind you, he's young, about 30. His eyes widen and he looks at me, but he doesn't say anything. His face turns a really, really deep shade of blue and his eyes roll back in his head, but they don't close. They're glassy. It's almost like I could see the moment the breath left his body. There was nothing there. The train stops. I get out at that stop, run to the booth, and I see a lady who's on the phone. I'm trying to get her attention. Lady, lady, we have somebody on the train who's unconscious. Please call 911. Call 911. What? Call 911. Apparently, I had interrupted a pretty good conversation. Whatever you have to do to keep yourself awake at 3 30 in the morning. Uh, so I step back on the train. And slowly, people are starting to wake up and realize what's happening. Uh, this guy is slumped over. I see a young, tough-looking mama, maybe 22, sitting in the corner with cornrows. Her child curled up against her, asleep like a rock. She gets up, and she says, I used to work EMT. She takes the guy, gets him on the floor, opens his shirt, and starts to do chest massages. Not exactly CPR. People start to gather around the man. I am at his left foot. People are holding his hands. The CPR, the EMT arrive, and they begin to work. They start chest compressions. They start to use a defibrillator. And we're all around him, touching him. And they don't stop us. I'm rubbing his left leg really, really hard. I'm almost trying to cause some sort of pain, thinking maybe that'll help bring him back. Come on, man, fight, fight, fight. Come on, come on, man, fight. You can do it, you can do it. We're all yelling and praying and crying and kneeling around him for a moment. 
his eyes flutter and there's some life in him for just a moment. And then just as quickly as it came, it goes. The EMT consider, they continue their chest compressions and we all are there just focused <laughs> intently on this one moment, this one man willing his heart to beat again and, and for him to take another breath. At that moment, it's almost like I kind of leave my body and I see the whole scene. And I see New York, the club kids and the businessmen and the maids coming from their second shift jobs maybe, or going to their third ones, or coming from an extramarital tryst, or coming back from the club. And we're all there united, and that one hope that he'll take another breath. Come on, man, fight, 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 fight. I hear a voice and then realize that it's mine. I'm back in my body, but he's not. The compressions go on for a while. The EMT usher us off the train and we stand there for a while watching them, a long, long, long while as they try to bring him back. He doesn't come back. He does not come back. And I stand there on the platform in this sea of humanity, in the soup of people that is New York, all hugging each other and crying and trying to process what the hell just happened. A young kid comes up to me and hugs me. He's maybe about 17. I fall into his arms and I'm not ashamed and I cry. His arms are around me and then one slips up to cup my breast. A moment that took me a long time to to process a long time after the fact that this, this moment that was filled with such hope and such unity and, and was about the good and, and the hopefulness of humanity was marred by this violation. It was all a lot to process. I leave the platform finally and go out into the night as the sun comes up. And I pray like I never prayed before that his soul has safe pas passage into the next realm. And I go home and sleep. Okay, so my Bill Murray story uh, begins like a lot of people's Bill Murray stories, which is mine begins with my dad's friend, Frank. Uh, that's just how it goes, I guess. Uh, and so in order to understand my dad's friend, Frank, you have to understand my parents. So I have weird parents. Um, my dad is like a fast talking big dude from New Jersey. And his job for most of my childhood was that he was in a uh, and a sports agent for jockeys for like horse riding jockeys and that was his job and then he went back to law school and now he's a horse lawyer which is his real job and he's he's uh, impulsive and he's a gambler and he just like lives this like, like sort of wild lifestyle and the funniest thing about my dad is that he's married to my mom which is so funny because my mom is an Italian professor. Uh, you know, she, she's a scholar and she goes to Catholic mass five times a week. Like she's serious about it for her. Catholicism is like 
a religion. Uh, she cares about it a lot. And so it's so funny that they're together. The best way I can describe their marriage is that my mom will talk to my dad in Italian and my dad will respond in present tense Spanish and they can understand each other. And so from the outside, like nobody knows what's going on, but they perfectly like get, they're in sync. And so for my mom, my first communion, my second grade eating of the Eucharist was like a big deal for her. It was like her Kentucky Derby. She was like super excited about it. It was like a sweet 16 and a quinceanera all combined into one, a bar mitzvah, all those things. For her, that was my first communion. And so <laughs> she wanted to have this big party with like 20 members of my family. And it was a big deal. She saved up for like years. She was like, we're gonna have a really nice party. We're gonna go to a really nice restaurant. Um, we're gonna get everybody in the same room. And the night before, uh, May 4th, 2002, at about two in the morning, my family gets a phone call from the restaurant, this restaurant Jonathan's on Long Island. And they said, hey, we had a kitchen fire last night and we can't have your party tomorrow. And my mom is devastated. This is like Christmas is canceled, everything's over. And my dad like always has a guy for these types of situations. For example, like I saw Hamilton with the original cast because my dad got tickets from a guy named Tomatoes. And so it was like we were sitting in a seat that's like reserved for the mob, basically. And so my dad had a restaurant guy and the restaurant guy he had was the Mater D at Peter Luger's Steakhouse. Not the one in Brooklyn, but the one in Great Neck on Long Island. And so for years, anytime my dad wanted, he'd get a table for two, and he could just sort of walk in and talk to Frank and get a table, no matter how crowded it was. But 12 hours before my first communion party, my dad needs to get a table for 20 people on Kentucky Derby Day, which is like a packed out Saturday at every steakhouse in the world. And Frank just like makes it happen. He like moves stuff around, he greases some palms, he like figures it out. And my mom, who doesn't wanna spend any money ever under any circumstance, is now telling my dad, like, we need to make this happen no matter what it costs because, like, it's Jesus is involved. And so we get to the restaurant. I'm in, I'm in second grade. And I'm like, this isn't the restaurant I remember. I thought we were supposed to go to another place. My mom was like, oh, uh, no, there was a change of plans. That restaurant's kitchen burned down. And so we get there and it ends up being a really perfect party. Frank saves the day. And I'll never forget my mom coming over to me. It's like, Gabe, did it work out? Are you okay? And I was like, eating ice cream and somebody had just given me a Space Jam VHS. So I was like, yeah, mom, this is like the best communion ever. Good on you. So that's like part A of the story that like Frank saved the day. So part B and the important Bill Murray part is that when I graduated college, or when I graduated high school, my best friend Nick and I had both gotten into college and we were really excited. And our dads were like, why don't we take the boys to Peter Luger Steakhouse to celebrate? They, they did high school together. We're proud of them. And they bring us to, to Peter Luger's and Frank seats us. He gives us this nice table. And we're sitting there enjoying dinner and Bill Murray walks in. And Bill Murray, and the whole restaurant now is just like staring at Bill Murray because that's what you do when Bill Murray works, walks into your restaurant. So we're having dinner and we start talking about Bill Murray movies, like the kids, you know, Nick and I, our best friend, we're talking about, you know, like Ghostbusters and Caddyshack um, and Lost in Translation. Uh, and uh, we're just like having a great time reciting Bill Murray movies. And as Nick and I are about to get up to leave Peter Luger's, we hear Bill Murray yell across the whole restaurant, hey, is that Gabe over there? And so the whole restaurant turns to look at me. And so what had happened was Frank had told Bill Murray to mess with us in front of all of Peter Luger's. And so I walk over and in this galaxy brain worlds colliding, the only thing I can think to say to Bill Murray in this moment is, thank you, Bill Murray, for Space Jam. <laughs> thus combining my my <laughs> my life as a second grader and my first communion and this incredible celebration of graduating high school and so when i think <laughs> about celebration and i when i think about family i think about frank hooking us up and about bill murray 
uh, messing with us. Uh, and just uh, in, these, in these trying times, it's nice to remember when things felt a little bit simpler and a little bit sillier. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you.